Hello and welcome to this video lecture on diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion are sometimes necessary for organizational success. As businesses compete globally, they need to figure out how to maximize their effectiveness with customers and with employees. A Caucasian guy selling hair care products door to door in an African American neighborhood might not do as well as an African American person doing the same. Customers like to see people who look like them representing companies with whom they do business. Let's get started. Diversity is defined as dealing with the collective mixture of differences and similarities along a given dimension. Examples of diversity dimensions include age, background, education, personality, lifestyle, sexual orientation, geographic origin, tenure with an organization, exempt or non-exempt employee status, management or non-management. The United States of America is the most diverse country in the world. Here we see three photos of markets in Nigeria, China, and Bolivia from left to right. One might be hard pressed to identify differences along any dimension except sex from these photos alone. The point is that diversity does not always involve outwardly visible characteristics. In fact, it is the unseen characteristics of diversity that are most important to organizations. So if we dig deeper than superficial differences, we might see differences in any or all of these photos along the dimensions of education, sexual orientation, and certainly personality. Companies seek a diverse workforce for the experiences that employees have often as a result of superficial differences. Let's move on. Here are some dimensions upon which people differ. In the innermost dark gray circle, we have things over which no one has control. You cannot pick your age or your race or your ethnic heritage. Let's not quibble over gender and sex, so we'll just regard it as biological sex, which cannot be changed. Chromosomes are permanent. So, most of these dimensions are visible to observers. These are the primary differences between people. On the outer circle, in the light gray circle, we see secondary dimensions, which often arise because of the primary dimensions. These are the things over which we have some choice, mostly. We cannot choose our first language, but our parents can choose it for us, so it's still a choice. However, we do choose our work style, our family status, our military experience, our religion, etc. Because of differences in these small circle primary dimensions, some of us are more likely to have meaningful differences in secondary dimensions. Does it really matter for the most part if a worker is older, young, gay or straight, white or black? Probably not. However, being old, straight, and white can give rise to differences in the secondary dimensions than will being young, Hispanic, and gay. A young, Hispanic, gay person is much more likely to have different secondary dimensions than the old, straight, white guy. These differences could manifest themselves in dimensions like organizational level, communication style, first language, and even family status. So you see that the primary dimensions serve as causal mechanisms which give rise to secondary dimensions, which are the characteristics that we truly seek in employees. We hire for education, for work style, work experience, communication style, etc. We do not usually hire for race, biological sex, or age. Let's move on. Here are some diversity paradigms. A paradigm is an acceptable way of looking at things that does not change much over time. For example, in the world of medicine, the ancient view that illness was caused by one or more of the four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and or black bile, gave way to a paradigmatic shift to the germ theory of illness that scientists embrace to this day. The first diversity paradigm is the discrimination and fairness paradigm, which is the most common method of approaching diversity. It focuses on equal opportunity, fair treatment, recruitment of minorities, and strict compliance with the equal employment opportunity laws. These are things that almost no one could disagree with. The focus in this paradigm is on assimilation into the great melting pot of society. 
The second paradigm is the access and legitimacy paradigm that focuses on the acceptance and celebration of differences to ensure that the diversity within a company matches the diversity found among primary stakeholders like customers, suppliers, etc. This paradigm establishes a clear business reason for diversity. In sum, companies should want employees who are similar to their diverse customers, suppliers, etc. Here, the focus is on differentiation, which is a celebration of our differences and the value we place on them. The third paradigm is the learning and effectiveness paradigm, which focuses on integrating deep level diversity differences, such as personality, attitudes, beliefs, and values into the actual work of the organization. It is consistent with organizational plurality, where members of a work environment are empowered to contribute, and each member is respected by not segmenting people on basis of group membership. This paradigm values the unseen characteristics of diversity to more fully enable organizational success. Let's move on. Despite the widely accepted schools of thought or paradigms regarding the issue of diversity, there are some barriers to accepting diversity which people do espouse. The first is prejudice, which simply means to prejudge someone. Prejudging someone based upon primary diversity characteristics like age, sex, etc. limits the opportunity to maximize someone's potential as well as the potential of the organization. For example, there's a guy named Johnny Kim who is of Asian descent. He is a Navy SEAL, a Harvard-educated physician, and an astronaut. Johnny, please leave some accomplishments for the rest of us. Prejudging him on anything would be a major mistake. The second on this brief list is ethnocentrism which is the belief that one's own culture is best and that other cultures should be subordinate to one's culture. It's a very narrow view of culture. Americans are notorious for this notion, but if you really, really think about it, American culture takes the best of all other cultures and assimilates them into one heterogeneous culture. American culture might actually be the best because it borrows the best from the best. The third barrier is stereotyping. This means that we ascribe an entire litany of characteristics to a person or a group because of one single trait, ability, or characteristic. Stereotyping is what has kept some females from getting involved in these STEM fields. Lately, that barrier has been broken down, digging even deeper. For most of history, women were not allowed to study higher education at all, not only just the STEM fields, but anything. Now the percentage of college students who are female is actually larger than the percentage of college students who are male. That is a remarkable destruction of the stereotype previously held against women pursuing higher education. Concurrent with discrimination against females in education has been the trouble that some women have faced in the workplace. Sexual harassment is discrimination based upon sex. It is of two types. The first is quid pro quo, which is Latin for something for something. It rears its ugly head when a person demands that another person submit to sexual favors as a condition of employment or promotion. The other type of sexual harassment is the hostile work environment. In that form, a workplace can be so sexually charged that it makes someone completely uncomfortable with their job. Now, both of these types of sexual harassment need to be either severe or pervasive. Sexual harassment that is severe involves non-subtle demands for sex, groping co-workers, watching pornography at work, consistently making sexually charged so-called jokes in the workplace, etc. Sexual harassment that is pervasive happens again and again and again. It need not be severe to be harassment. It can just be so omnipresent that it makes the workplace intolerable. Sexual harassment is against the law. Specifically, it is against Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
which is abbreviated here as CRA64. It is a violation of civil rights because it involves treating someone badly based upon their sex. It can be male-on-female harassment, female-on-male harassment, or even sex, same-sex harassment. One shortcoming of CRA 64 is that it did not allow for punitive and compensatory damages, nor did it allow for a trial by jury. To rectify those shortcomings, the Civil Rights Act of 1991 allowed for compensatory and punitive damages, as well as something other than a trial by a jury. These things are important because until 1991, someone might win a case, but only get back pay for the time that they would have worked, but were forced to quit because of the harassment, and they could not have a trial by their peers. Some crusty old judge in rural Mississippi might look differently at sexual harassment than would a jury of local Mississippians who might have endured similar circumstances. Let's move on. Geert Hofstede is considered to be the world's preeminent authority on differences in culture around the world. When we think of a culture, we typically think of it in terms of a national culture. But there is very little difference between Algerian and Tunisian culture. In fact, one might be able to lump both of these countries together with Libya and some other North African countries into a pan-Arab culture. They share more than they are different. Nevertheless, it is easier to make a country and its culture interchangeable. There are ways of differentiating one culture or country from another. These are called cultural dimensions. The first is power distance, which is the extent to which the less powerful members of institutions accept and expect that power will be distributed unequally. Not only do people in high power distance countries like Mexico or India accept vast power differences, they expect them. This can make managing subordinates in those two countries very different than in a low power distance country like Sweden or the USA. The second is individualism versus collectivism, which dictates that all members of society are expected to fend for themselves on the individualistic end of the spectrum. In an individualistic culture, people have weaker familial bonds than in a collective culture. In America, people tend to move out of their parents' house as soon as they can, which is usually between the ages of 18 and 22. In collectivistic cultures, multiple generations of a family live in one house. Collectivism dictates that people are expected to care for one another. Individualistic countries like the USA and Australia have very different cultures than collectivistic countries like Pakistan and India. A third cultural dimension is masculinity versus femininity. In masculine cultures, members place high value on assertiveness. These cultures have a stick-up-for-yourself sort of culture. Examples include Austria, Germany, and Canada. A feminine culture places high value on caring for others. Examples include most Latin American countries. A fourth dimension of culture is uncertainty avoidance, which is the degree to which society members are uncomfortable with unstructured situations in which surprises or novel situations are likely to occur. It's a double negative. Think of uncertainty avoidance as always wanting the sure thing. Risk is to be avoided in a culture with high uncertainty avoidance or a culture that always wants the sure thing. In the USA, we value novel situations and opportunities, which is why entrepreneurship is such a vital part of our culture. A word of caution is in order regarding these cultural dimensions. They are not an either or sort of thing. A culture is not either individualistic or collectivistic. A culture falls somewhere on the spectrum spanning from extremely individualistic to extremely collectivistic and all points in between. Think of it as a Likert response scale from 1 to 7. A country can fall at the 2.4 mark or the 6.8 mark or any mark between 1 and 7. It's not black and white. It's all shades of gray. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.